Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Um, we are very um, delighted to have Lucinda taking us through her um, life within the Ballet Orchestra. Um, uh, for those who don't know, Lucinda Cren. Lucinda Cren is principal of Orchestra Victoria, which is in um, Australia, obviously, and in the state of Victoria. Um, yeah, and we'll, we'll let her take her away. <laughs> Thank you, Hamble. Hopefully everyone can hear me and just raise your hands as, as Hamble has said. If, if there are any questions or anything that you want to ask me as we go along, please feel free. I have a four month old, very rambunctious mini schnauzer puppy circling who loves to chew my feet. So hopefully there won't be squeals of pain from me. I've sent him outside with a, a pig's ear, but I apologize if there, there could be an interruption from him. Let's hope not. I've been the principal bassoon of Orchestra Victoria since 1989, which is quite a long time now. I'll start by telling you a bit about my background and, and how I came to join the orchestra in the first place. I was born in Sydney into a musical family with both parents were professional musicians. My mother was a viola player and my father was a professional bassoon player. And my parents met and married when they were both members of the Western Australian Symphony Orchestra. They had gone across from Adelaide and Sydney, respectively, to, to join that orchestra when it was just brand new. So they met over there and eventually, after a stint in Tasmania, they ended up in Sydney and my, my dad ended up in the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. So I started piano at six and I had a go at the violin, the cello, and the flute before taking up the bassoon at 13. And I studied with my dad. It was only ever meant to be a second study for me because I went to the Conservatorium High School in Sydney as a piano major and we had to do a second study. So I did the flute for a bit there and then so many people played the flute in those days and I thought, well, I'll try something different. I'll do the bassoon. And it meant I could have, have lessons with dad but it was never going to be a career. That was never part of my plan. I was a bit of a novelty in those days as a 13-year-old girl playing the bassoon, and there's been others that have followed behind me as well. Lorelei is one of those people from Sydney as well. But I, I wasn't a very big girl, and there were a lot of jokes about the bassoon being about the same size as me, the same height. And I don't have overly big hands, and in those days, everybody played with a neck strap. And my father invented a seat strap for me, which he made out of seat belt material and felt. And I learned to play the bassoon with that. I also had a mouthful of braces at the time, so it was a bit of a, a, an interesting experience. Everybody in those days, as I said, was using neck straps. Or if you were from Britain, they, they often had a spike on the end of of the bassoon. So I was one of the earliest people around that was using a seat strap and to this day I still play on a seat strap that my father made for me and interesting enough he could never manage a seat strap himself. He played all his life with an neck strap around his neck which I find incredibly uncomfortable and I couldn't do it. When I finished high school, I had every intention of doing a degree on the piano and becoming an accompanist, playing chamber music or maybe even a repetitor to work with singers. That really appealed to me. I looked at my dad's life and he was the principal bassoon of the Sydney Symphony Orchestra for over 40 years and I thought that just seemed so boring. At this time, I was still studying the piano and having accompanying lessons and I would play the bassoon in Sydney Youth Orchestra every Saturday and I was very lucky that we had Richard Gill, the late Richard Gill, as our conductor, so he was quite a mentor for me in those early days. But bassoon was just, at this stage, it was still just something I did for fun. There weren't a lot of bassoonists around that time. Uh, there are so many more now, but there weren't a lot of us around at that time and when a position came up in the ABC training orchestra, I auditioned and was accepted and my piano studies took a back seat. The ABC training orchestra unfortunately doesn't exist anymore, but
but it was a full-time position for a year where we spent our days playing orchestral repertoire and being paid a wage to do it. We gave concerts and it was also used as a feeder for the ABC orchestras so that if somebody was sick in one of the orchestras, they would often take a player from the ABC training orchestra to fill that gap. We had the opportunity to play in both chairs, so first chair and second chair for bassoon for me. And I also learned to play the contrabassoon at this time. And I still, at this point, had every intention of, of doing a year with the training orchestra and then going back to the piano. But I have to say, the lure of playing the bassoon and actually earning money was very appealing to be actually earning, earning money to do that. So in case you're wondering, my instrument, I was very lucky to have the opportunity to play a spare instrument of Dad's, which was a 9,000 series heckle, and it's made of palisander wood, and I still play that instrument to this day. Dad had bought the instrument secondhand. He had a number of instruments because he was fairly obsessed, shall we say. He bought the instrument from Martin Woolley, who was the principal bassoon of the Queensland Theatre Orchestra. And when Martin retired, I applied for that job up in Brisbane, won the audition, and moved to Brisbane, to the Queensland Theatre Orchestra which was a, a chamber-sized orchestra with double woodwind with the second playing in the bassoon section, the second player doubled on contra. And we were intro, um, directed, here comes a piece of, sorry, duck jerky for the door, directed by Georg Tinkner. And I was 20 years old at the time when I won that position. It was the perfect place to learn lots of Mozart and Haydn symphonies to play for ballet with Queensland Ballet, the Queensland Lyric Opera, and to have follow opportunities and chamber music. We also travelled around Queensland. And I learnt to double tongue in this job, in this first professional job of mine, because I couldn't do it properly before then. But we had so many Mozart symphonies to play and lots of opportunities to play the Hafner, for instance, and that was a great chance for me to master double tonguing. I was there in Brisbane for three years before I decided to return to Sydney because I, I was young, I was away from home for the first time and I was pretty homesick. So I then, I worked as a casual player with the Australian Chamber Orchestra, Miss Beeson Sydney Orchestra, Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, Sydney Symphony Orchestra. And then I won a position of the second bassoon in the SSO beside my father, which was great, great opportunity, but hard to always be in your father's footsteps. So after about 18 months there, the position of principal bassoon in the state Orchestra Victoria, as it was called then, now Orchestra Victoria, became vacant. I flew to Melbourne to do the audition, was successful, and moved down to do a trial. After three months on trial with the orchestra, I was confirmed in the job, and I've been there ever since. The time has flown by, and I can honestly say that I love my job. Of course, there are ups and downs, but what appeared to me as a young, naive person watching my dad go off to work every day and thinking how boring it was to play in an orchestra couldn't be further from the truth. My job is very varied in Orchestra Victoria. We accompany Opera Australia, the Australian Ballet and the Victorian Opera. Sometimes the hours are erratic. The repertoire is always interesting and there are lots of challenges there. We have great colleagues and interesting conductors and soloists. We also have the opportunity to perform on stage and in chamber music ensembles. No two weeks are exactly the same and that can be a challenge but it also offers wonderful variety. I've also really liked the fact that while I, I was still following my father's footsteps, I was focusing on a different repertoire from him and, and that was a, a chance to make a name for myself. So what is it like to work in Orchestra Victoria and to work in an orchestra pit? How does an opera come about? How do I prepare for an opera season? Well, firstly, the decision is made around the rostering. We have three players in the bassoon section. We have a principal, an associate principal, who also plays first and second. 
and a principal contrapuntist soon player, and he also plays second bassoon. During an Australian opera season, there might be three operas running at once, and as principal, I would play two of those operas and cover one. Covering means that I must be prepared to go in at a moment's notice if someone is ill and play that opera on no rehearsals, which can be a bit daunting. So prior to the first orchestral rehearsal, the music's made available. After so long in the job, I, I'm lucky I've covered a lot of repertoire, but if something new comes up, I, I like to put my hand up and always go for something different because it's, I like that challenge. To prepare for the orchestral rehearsal, I like to re research the conductor. That's one of the first things I like to do is find out who is going to be conducting us. I like to listen to lots of recordings and work through the opera at home in my practice room at least twice before the first orchestral rehearsal. With our job, you're expected to be prepared and there's, there's no time to learn on the job. So we occasionally have some harsh, harsh European conductors who expect everything to be right from day one and some can be quite abrupt and almost rude in their manner, which can be a challenge. Some don't like women in principal positions, and I've certainly encountered that. I've had my fair share of that over the years. But fortunately, that's a dying, brand, a dying breed, and it's really not acceptable anymore. I make sure that I have a supply of suitable reeds to get me through the opera season, and I don't actually make my own, and I never have. And I think there's two reasons for that. One, that when I started out, I just wasn't interested because I really didn't think this was going to be a long-term thing. And secondly, I watched my father make reeds and spent his entire life looking for the perfect reed. His entire life, he was still he was still searching for that perfect reed. So I don't make my own. I've experimented over the years with playing different performances on different reeds in a season, maybe two or three different ones throughout a season, but. Now, whenever I can, I prefer to stick to one read and try and make it last. I'm a great one for cleaning out my reads really regularly and trying to keep them alive that way. From experience, I know that what works at home may not work in the acoustic of repeat and vice versa. So I'm very careful to leave any fine tuning of my reads until we get into the pit and we're actually in a performance situation. I like my reeds to be very flexible and to have the ability to play softly, which is often called for when you're accompanying singers. For an opera, we might have three orchestral rehearsals. Particularly if an opera has three acts, we might have one rehearsal of each act. And these rehearsals are two and a half hours long with a 15 minute break in the middle. We have an hour for lunch, so a typical rehearsal day might be. 10 to 4. After the orchestral rehearsals are completed, next comes the Sits Pro, which is the first rehearsal where the singers join us. They join the orchestra for the first time. They usually arrive, they're, they're quite an interesting breed working with professional opera singers. They, they usually come with a lot of fanfare, with throat lozenges, lots of bottles of water. Chairs are lined up and they just stand and sing from their places with no acting or costumes or stage movements at this stage. Sometimes there are very glamorous international guest stars who come, which is always exciting. They often arrive dripping in jewellery, lots of air kissing and loud talking in Italian and Russian. The singers are, are typically extremely careful about their voices and sometimes they won't sing at full voice at these rehearsals, so they just mark the part. This rehearsal is usually a straightforward run of the opera, only going over things if, if timing allows. And there are very strict rules with all of these things with the award that we run under and Times have to be adhered to, otherwise if there is going to be overtime, they've got the extra payments and they've got to let us know about that in advance. There's all sorts of complications with that sort of thing. Unlike the orchestral rehearsals, once we start working with the singers, the rehearsals are three hours long instead of two and a half hours. 
and they never start before 10.30 in the morning for singers. That's a special thing that they have, so we get a bit of a sleeping too. Once that this probe is out of the way, the next rehearsal will be in the pit at the State Theatre. And our production staff will go in ahead of us and they'll bump in, which means they move all the gear across the road from our rehearsal venue by truck. This can include the timpani, the percussion, the double bass, boxes, the harp, etc., or any other gear that needs to go. They then set the pit up in formation, which will have been decided in advance. And there's often a lot of meetings about how to set the orchestra and what's the best way for each opera or each ballet. Usually the woodwinds sit in the middle against the back wall, which is my preferred seating position. That's similar to a symphony orchestra. Sometimes we sit on the side, which happens quite a bit for, for instance, Rossini operas. They like us on the side, the woodwind on the side. And you have to then adapt to seeing the conductor's feet from the side, which is a different experience again. One of our favourite conductors is actually a French conductor who does a lot of opera work with us and he's left-handed, so that's different again. These days before we can even enter the State Theatre, we all have to do safety inductions online. That's a, a really big thing this year and this at these days, not this year, it happens every year. And uh, we're, we're constantly having to update our safety knowledge this educates us for any emergencies that might arise. And we're then issued with security passes. And the latest thing with COVID is now we, we're having photos on those passes as well. This allows us access to the lifts and backstage areas of the theatre. The street level for the State Theatre in Melbourne is called Level 6. So to access the pit, we actually take the lift underground and we're below the Yarra River to level one. Occasionally we've been in the pit where there's been a fire safety drill and we've then had to walk up six flights of stairs to the street level and my legs are usually like jelly by the time I get up there. The safety warden always says to us, in an emergency, you must leave your instruments in the pit and walk up those stairs. And fortunately, there has never actually been an emergency because I seriously doubt any professional musician would leave their instruments behind. And I know we'll be clamouring over each other, carrying those instruments all the way up to the street. In the pit, one of the difficulties that we have to deal with is the lighting. And we read our music by sconces, which have really improved over the years, fortunately. These lights are attached to our music stands. And we used to have very yellowed music scores as well, but now a lot of that's been replaced by white paper, which makes it a lot easier to read in the dim light. We once had a blackout in the pit during a performance. And a colleague of mine helped me out by turning the torch on his mobile phone on and shining it on my music, which saved the day until the lights went back on. Speaking of mobile phones, we've also had an experience where we were doing a season in Sydney for the Olympic Arts Festival and we were playing Valero as a ballet season and one of our principal wind players, I won't mention who it was, uh, was playing the big solo for her instrument and her mobile phone started ringing in her handbag, which was at her feet. And it was a very interesting experience. She played that solo beautifully while kicking her handbag at the same time in a, a desperate effort to turn that phone off. These days, phones are banned in the pit. Most of the time, I can't see anything from the stage because I'm under the overhang of that, that stage. So I'm. it can also be really hard to hear singers when I'm there. Uh, we have vocal cues marked in the past, but sometimes I can't make sense of those because they're in foreign languages and when you can't actually hear them properly, that's a bit of a, a difficulty. And sometimes it's just, hard to follow them. 
So I, I make sure I mark my part up with as many musical cues as I possibly can. I like to write in what other instruments have solos or anything that I need to look out for. And of course, particularly if I have anything exposed coming up, I like to make that very clear in my part if I need to make eye contact with the conductor. And this is not just for me, but this is also very important and it's going to be even more important with, with COVID in the world because if anybody goes off sick and has to suddenly come in and replace me or replace any of my colleagues, they need the parts to be very clear so that they can just slip into that role easily. They need to know where there are any danger spots coming up or changes in dynamics or even notes. Of course, working with singers can be challenging because it'll be different every performance. So it's very important that we have to be alert and aware at all times. It's very different from playing a, a symphony orchestra where you've, you've got some sort of control. In the pit, playing for opera and, and the ballet too, you're, you're relying on, on the stage and you're relying on that conductor telling you how things need to be. So we don't have the same flexible flexibility that you do when you're playing on stage. There have been times when singers have missed a line and the orchestra have moved collectively to accommodate them. When I first joined the orchestra, we used to have a, a prompt box which would be situated above my head where someone would sit and quietly call out vocal prompts if, if needed if one of the singers lost their way on stage. And this prompter would climb up a little ladder and sit in that box above my head for rehearsals and performances. That's the thing of the past now. It just doesn't happen. And I think a lot of the singers these days are maybe better trained, better education. I'm, I'm not sure. But when I first started, there were actually some very well-known, very, very good singers that didn't actually read music, had beautiful voices but didn't read music. So... Those sort of people were often relying on the prompts, but that doesn't seem to be the way anymore. We can sometimes have a cast change midway through a season, and even a, occasionally a new conductor will come in and take over for some performances without rehearsing. And this is where the experience and expertise of the orchestra comes to the fore. We've even saved a few conductors over the years too when they've dropped beats and the orchestra has moved as one following the concert master and kept the show going. So at this stage we've had a couple of stage orchestrals with the singers in costume. These rehearsals are, are vital to make sure that everything between the stage and the orchestra in the pit works seamlessly. It's also our opportunity to find out if there are any issues like dry ice. That's pretty horrible when it floats into the pit and you can't see the conductor, and we have had that before. And uh, particularly awful when you're playing a woodwind instrument and you take a big breath of, of dry ice and you taste those chemicals. Sometimes there are gunshots, bright lights that need to be repositioned so they don't shine into the orchestra pit, flying props. We've had a few near misses with daggers, buttons flying off costumes, and even fake blood that has flown, rained down on some string players. We do have a net over that pit, but it wouldn't stop a person falling in and it wouldn't protect us if something heavy fell in. We recently, at a, a rehearsal, had a technician working on the stage of the side of the stage. He was hammering some wood. I'm not quite sure what happened, but he dropped something into the pit and unfortunately slit the timpani head, which wasn't a good day, as you can imagine. Once the stage orchestrals are over, there's a dress rehearsal, which is also known as the general. This is usually open to an audience, which is often friends and guests of the opera company, and it's run as a performance. We once had a memorable, memorable dress rehearsal of Traviata when the soprano's character was dying of consumption near the end of the opera, but she was still able to put her head up from her deathbed and sing. 
there was a group of high school students at that rehearsal who thought that was extremely funny and all started to laugh. We had an Italian conductor at the time who got very angry with that and insisted that all the audience leave and we had to wait quite a while while they all got out and then we were able to finish the dress rehearsal. In opera, you sometimes have to suspend belief. When I first started my career, it was felt that opera singers needed to be really big people and there were some extremely large singers and it was felt that was the best body shape to have the best voices and also that their voices would peak at a later age. And there were many performances where you would have a young teenage character, for instance, Juliet in Romeo and Juliet, and it would be sung by maybe a woman in her 50s or 60s, sometimes quite a large woman, and that was always interesting. It's not like that anymore. A lot of the singers are considerably younger when they're making their debuts, and fitness is much more of an important issue these days as well. So that has really changed. After that dress rehearsal, there's usually a day off before opening night to allow the singers a chance to rest and recover. Sometimes the orchestra has a free day as well, but as a section leader, I might have meetings, rostering meetings or section meetings, or even have to attend a rehearsal of something else. The performances are always exciting and there's a real buzz in the air from the audience. I try to always remember that this is a big night out for people and they've often paid a lot of money to go to see a, a performance. So I try to always bring my A game. For me, that means a rest in the afternoon if possible before getting into the theatre early to warm up properly. I continue to practice the part throughout the season which for me is important when we might be playing different operas on alternative nights. I like to keep touching base with that part. Typically, I probably work four or five nights a week during a season with rehearsals during the day as well. I try to practice every day, but some days I just feel fresher if I go into the theatre and I haven't actually practiced that day. The audience's response is always interesting and I usually from where I sit have a very clear view of the front row and it's great to see people enjoying themselves. Not so great when they talk through the overture or walk in late and for some reason people sitting in the front row often come in late, I don't know why, and then they have to cross, climb across other people while we're playing and they often seem to be the people that are sitting right behind the conductor. People taking flash photography is awful. That's particularly annoying. Watching people try to stay awake through the performances is, is quite entertaining. They probably don't realise that we can see them very clearly. And we used to have a regular opera subscriber for many years who sat in the same seat in the front row of every opening night. He always wore a tuxedo and he mouthed the words to the opera. He was a real opera buff. We've also had a dog bark in the audience. I guess a guide dog, and people rushed out on stretches. I only remember one performance being cancelled and I think from memory that was due to a cast member not making a plane in from interstate and so being delayed into Melbourne. With the ballet, we've had a proposal on stage, conductor to ballerina, and she said yes. And a, a delay in a performance while an injured dance, dancer was actually rushed to hospital and a replacement took over. And luckily that dancer came back at the end of the performance on crutches and he was okay. We've also had a, a chandelier breaking on stage, which brought the curtain down until they could clean that all up off the stage. In the pit, there have been a few instances of string players having to go out mid-performance to replace the string. We've had a concert master preparing for a solo when a string has broken and they've had to hand their instrument to a colleague who's then gone out to get a new string and they, the concert master has had to play that solo on the other person's instrument. Luckily, it doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. We've had half strings break and they make a, an amazing sound as, as they go too, so quite loud. 
One of the really big issues these days with playing anywhere in, in the profession is noise. And noise protection is taken incredibly seriously these days. We're routinely sent for hearing tests and we all have custom-made earplugs. The noise levels in the pit are monitored at every rehearsal and every performance, and we're advised as to when earplugs are required to be worn. So particularly if we've got two shows on a Saturday of a ballet, for instance, or even two different operas on a Saturday, they will have a, a notice on our stand if the noise levels are going to exceed a safe level, and we then have to wear earplugs. Playing with earplugs takes quite an adjustment and many of us practice with plugs in at home, which is what the audiologist actually advises us to do. We've been told we should be practicing with earplugs at all times. I certainly wear them for loud passages, but I will take them out if I've got anything exposed or a solo coming up. We also have movable screens in the pit to help with the acoustics and sometimes to block off the brass sound for us to make it a little easier to deal with. And we have a movable black blanket behind us on the wall at the back of the pit, which goes up or goes down depending on, on the conductor's preference sometimes because some conductors feel that the wind sound on the back wall bounces off into the, the pit. And so sometimes we have that as a, a bit of a muffle. Playing the bassoon in the opera repertoire gives me the opportunity to focus on making a really lyrical sound, particularly when accompanying or even playing a duet with, with a singer. We don't have as many string players as a symphony orchestra, so it can be a challenge to blend your sound. Some conductors have asked for very, very soft playing. We did we, we had a, a conductor some years ago with a French opera. I think it might have been Calais and Melisande. And I remember there were three or possibly even four bassoons and double wind of everybody else. And I remember this conductor really rode me softer, 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 softer. And so it became quite a, a challenge. I was determined that I played so softly that in the end he actually had to say, I can't hear you. So I, was, I felt that I had won that one. Unfortunately, as a pit player, one of the issues that we have is that we're not visible, obviously. We're not visible like an orchestra is on stage. And when surveys have been conducted in the past, it's been alarming that some members of the audience are oblivious to the fact that we're a full-time professional orchestra. Some are actually oblivious that there's live music. It, it's quite incredible, but it's the reality. In actual fact, we are employed by the Australian Ballet. Our equivalent orchestra in Sydney, which is the Australian Opera and Ballet Orchestra, are owned by Opera Australia, but we are owned by the Australian Ballet. And one of the benefits of that has, is that it's given us access to physios and gyms at the Ballet Centre. A lot of players, particularly string players, find the repetitive nature of our job, and they do a lot of calls as string players. They, they don't have as much rostering as the, the wing players do, but they find the repetitive nature of the job and also the fact that they're in a very limited space in the pit can lead to all sorts of issues, health issues, so injury issues. So having access to physios and and gym equipment at the ballet is really a wonderful addition for us. Mental health is now considered extremely important and we have access to experts there as well. That's, that's a relatively new thing, but it, it's considered extremely important. I personally love the ballet season and the variety of repertoire that that provides. It can be everything from traditional Swan Lake and Giselle to a full Tchaikovsky symphony and a lot of contemporary music now. We've just recently had a, a new artistic director of the ballet appointed and 
he's going down a very different path for next year and there's some very, very interesting works and new choreographers coming that we'll be working with. We've done a version of Rite of Spring with Sangara Dance Company, which is a contemporary Australian Indigenous dance company here. And if the opening bassoon solo of Rite of Spring wasn't hard enough in a symphonic form, this production starts with dancers moving about silently on stage. And I obviously can't see the stage, as I mentioned, and it's it's quite challenging because what happens is that I never know quite long, how long they're going to be moving on the stage and then suddenly the conductor will point at me and I'm expected to play that solo. It's uh, quite challenging. Ballet music is very uplifting, I find. Uh, obviously, they're dancing to it, so some of the traditional music is just lovely to play. And I've been lucky to work with some very inspiring ballet conductors over the years. Backstage, the corridors are filled with costumes, the smell of hairspray and perfume. It's a very electric atmosphere. There's always half-dressed dancers walking around too. You never know quite what you're going to find. Dancers used to smoke very heavily and that was believed to keep their weight under control, I think, but these days, not so much. And there's such a, a focus on nutrition and health. And as I said with the singers, it's the same with them. And, and the dancers have teams of medical staff, sports, medicine doctors, physios. And another change that, that I've really noticed is that body shapes have changed in the ballet company. There's a, a great diversity in shapes now and also in nationalities. We have all sorts of people from all over the world that have joined the Australian Ballet. Orchestra Victoria is a very inclusive company. We are very lucky there. And they're really open-minded group of people. We were very fortunate to continue to be paid through lockdown. We were one of the few professional art organisations that I think managed to stay on a full salary through lockdown. And now that things are starting to return to some degree of normality, we are looking forward to the opportunity to re recruit new players to fill the existing vacancies in the orchestra. One of these vacancies is the Associate Principal Bassoon Job. And whilst no date has yet been set for an audition, we are really hoping that it will go ahead in the first part of, of next year. Coronavirus as we all know, has shifted the goalposts and every time we make plans, something gets in the way. In fact, we, we finally managed to get back to work two weeks ago. I was in the building for two days and somebody tested positive, despite the fact that we're all double back. One of the dancers tested positive. I'd been in the gym at the same time and so I had to go and have a coronavirus test and wait until for the results before I was allowed to go back to work. We're having rapid antigen tests twice a week, but even so, we can still have positive cases. For the auditions within the orchestra, the, they'll be advertised on the ballet website. If you go to the Australian Ballet site and you go to music and you see jobs and musicalchairs.com. And the audition will be open to Australian and New Zealand citizens to begin with, which is great. It's a great way of trying to fill positions with Australian or New Zealand, obviously, but, but with local players first. We are legally bound to have two auditions before we can look for overseas players. So we hope to fill a job with local players, but if not, we can go and look wider a field, but we have to have had two auditions first before we can do that. Auditions themselves are very controversial. Just what is the best way to appoint people? What is the best way to hold an audition? And it's something we discuss every year. We go over and over and over it. It would be lovely to come up with a better way to appoint people, but at the end of the day, an audition does seem to be the fairest thing. I think the, some 
some people want to just invite people to audition, but that will cut out a whole lot of young players who are, are not known to us. And I think the fairest thing is to give everybody a chance to, to audition. So for a bassoon audition, candidates would be required to prepare part of a concerto, usually the first and second movements of the Mozart. That's the standard thing. And then a series of orchestral excerpts, which are chosen from the opera and ballet repertoire and symphonic repertoire, because we do actually do performances on stage with our orchestra as well, and we do symphonies, and we do chamber music, we do all sorts of things. So there can be almost anything in that audition. In the early days when I was first auditioning, you were given the music, the orchestral excerpts, 48 hours before that audition. And these days you can actually get the excerpts weeks in advance, so it's quite a different way of dealing with it. In my early days of auditions, I'd start preparing probably six weeks before auditioning by going through all the excerpts in the big Regini bassoon book. And I'd try to cover every possibility before those excerpts were handed out so that there wouldn't be any surprises. Just out of interest, in my career, I have done 14 auditions, five trials, and held three full-time positions. These days, it's, it's common practice to send a taped recording to an audition, but if you choose to do this, make sure it's the best quality of sound that you possibly can get. It has to be really high quality of sound. We've had so many tapes dismissed over the years because the sound just hasn't been good enough. And that is so sad when you know people have spent a lot of time, a lot of effort recording, and then if the quality of the sound is just no good, the panel will just dismiss it. And that's such a pity after all that work that's gone into it. It really is preferable to come to an audition if you can in person. And I know this costs money to fly. If you've got to fly interstate and you've got to pay for accommodation, I know, but it, it really is the best way to be there live if you can. On the day of the audition, an accompanist will be provided for you. I've always chosen to bring my own, and even when I've auditioned interstate, I've always arranged my own accompanist. And make sure that you have rehearsed your concerto with somebody prior to that audition. You'll get it. You'll get a run through on the day with the accompanist that's provided, but don't leave it to that. Really, really know the work well with a pianist in advance, and also play the excerpts to as many people as you possibly can to practice playing under stress. And we do the first round in our orchestra behind a screen. And this round will probably include a selection of excerpts, maybe three or four, and a section of that concerto. Once all the candidates have played that first round, the audition panel will vote as to who goes through to the second round. This is done by secret ballot, so at this point, we're not discussing anything. There's always a union steward who is there at the auditions and they sit in a position where they can see the panel and they can actually see the candidate as well. And if you have any issues, like you can't get the stand moved or you need a glass of water or something's not right with your chair, you can wave at that union steward, but keep quiet, don't, don't speak. It's, you need to stay anonymous. In the early days, people would say, don't wear shoes, come tiptoeing in so they can't tell if you're male or female. That was one of the things people used to say. I don't think we worry about that sort of thing anymore, but you, you do need to be quiet and, and not speak. That's important. For round two of the auditions, we take the screen away. And we can even go to a third round if we need to hear more. If we can't, agree we will often go a, a third round and then once we have hopefully agreed on a candidate they proceed to a trial with the orchestra which can last six months or even up to a year and during that time the candidate is given feedback on how things are going 
as you can see, I, I mentioned that I've done five trials and had three jobs. So that implies that I didn't pass a couple of those trials. And they were trials where three people were on trial at the same time. So two others apart from me. And in both of those instances, somebody else won the job. And that's the luck of the draw. And I just feel that the experience is invaluable, even if you don't win the job. And you've just got to go through that experience. Things to look out for at auditions, accuracy is so important and it sounds so obvious but it's surprising how we will have people that come in and actually play wrong notes in an excerpt or they miss rhythm. You have to be correct with everything, correct notes, correct rhythm, dynamic contrast are very important really know those excerpts well. Where do they come in the work? Where do they come in the opera? Listen to the whole opera, listen to the ballet. What is the style that you're trying to convey? How does it fit into the rest of the orchestra? Is it a solo or a tutti section? Listen to lots of recordings. And these days you have YouTube, which is a godsend that wasn't around when I was starting out. So you can hear everything these days and multiple performances which is fantastic. Intonation is incredibly big for the audition. We play at 441 in the orchestra. You need to tune incredibly carefully with the piano and take a moment to just blow a few notes to make sure you're comfortable in the environment. But just be so careful with the tuning. The screen that we use is a big black blanket. Don't be put off by that and just play normally. Don't see the screen and think I must play incredibly loudly to get through that. Don't sacrifice your tone. Still try to make a great sound. It will carry through that, that screen. For your Mozart concerto, try to play in a soloistic fashion but keep in mind that it's Mozart. Probably best not to be too controversial in the style of, of that. Remember always too that there are people on that panel listening to you that are not bassoon experts, but they are music experts. So every little detail counts. Be very careful when you prepare your excerpts, not to just focus on the technical difficulty. Sometimes not being quite accurate with just the length of a tied note can be enough for the panel to say, no, we don't want this person. Practice with a metronome and record yourself. Really listen very critically. Be hypercritical and focus on every detail. There's no time in the audition to settle in. You're expected to deliver right from the first note of your concerto. So practice running through your audition program without stopping and do this many times to build up your stamina. Don't compare yourself to others. That's one thing I would always advise. Everybody's got unique qualities to offer. And don't make assumptions that someone else will automatically get that job. I've heard so many people say, oh, it's no point auditioning because so-and-so is going for the job and they'll get it. Nothing is a given. So keep those ideas out of, out of your mind. Remember that you are unique and be prepared. Do your best. The panel are on your side and they want to see you well, do well. They really do. People say to me, oh, it must be so lovely to play music all day. And yes, it is, but there's also a lot of hard work that goes into it. But it's a rewarding career and it's also really enjoyable. I hope now that the world is returning to some sort of normality that live music will continue because there's nothing like it. And I hope to see you all in person at performances and not just on screen. I've attended some webinars during lockdown with orchestras from the UK and New Zealand. And it's great to see all the plans that they have going forward, particularly in Britain where they're that bit further ahead of us with opening everything and getting back to, to normal. Digital performances have opened up a new world of possibilities and I think these will continue. That is certainly something that will be happening for us. But honestly, nothing beats the atmosphere of, of being in a theatre full of people 
and the excitement when that curtain goes up. So thank you, that's my story. I haven't even looked to see if there are any questions. Doesn't look like there are at this point. But please feel free to say, and, oh, Lorelai's got a hand up. Oh, no, I don't. That was supposed to be a clap. <laughs> oh, a clap. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Lorelai. Not, not well, a hand up, sorry. But I do have a question, Lucinda. Um, on your musical bucket list, what do you want to play? What are you looking forward to play musically in your next yeah. few years? In my next few years, I I would really love to do some more chamber music, and I'm really hoping to do some some of the some wind works with piano and our orchestra actually gives us the opportunity to do some things like that. So that will be great. I hope we can we can do some more things like that. I've done so many things over the 30 plus years I've been in the orchestra. There is nothing that I'm desperate to do. We'll see what comes up. As I said, it's, it's an exciting time with a new artistic director for the ballet because he is going down a different path, so there will be some new and interesting things. There's an awful lot of wonderful ballet repertoire that we just can't do in this country because we don't have rights to it. A lot of things that, that are owned that European companies can do that we can't do. So while I'd love to say, that, you know, there's a, a lot more Stravinsky, with, there's things that we can't, can't actually legally do in this country. Maybe that'll change in the future. Maybe, but that was a great talk. Thanks, Lucinda. Thanks a lot. It was wonderful. Okay. Thanks for listening, Coraline. Lucinda, I do think you have a question in the chat. Um, I have a question in the chat. From Sarah. I think she wanted to know what your favourite opera and ballet or ballet was. Maybe both. <laughs> favourite opera or ballet, I I would have to say the Mozart the Mozart operas are lovely because the bassoon lines are just terrific, and it really gives you a chance to to feel like you're singing, and it, it's lovely to what what often happens with Mozart the bassoon will be in a duet with a soprano, so you have the bass bassoon and, and the high soprano, and and that's that's lovely. Ballet, oh, I love the Oh, probably Romeo and Juliet is one of the great ones. Cinderella is fantastic. Some of those big scores that are just so lush. And Alice in Wonderland that we, we've done a couple of seasons of now, that is extraordinary. And it also uses film and, and special effects on, on screen. That is that's sensational. So if that comes back again, it's definitely worth going and having a look at that one. And that's that's a contemporary composer and ah, terrific, terrific music. Is there any other questions? I have a question. Do you have any like dreaded operas or ballets? <laughs> you're like, oh my gosh, I don't want to do that. Ah, uh, hmm, that's a good question. Wagner. While Wagner is great, uh, it's it's so long they're always long and the stamina of trying to get through a Wagner opera when it's hours and hours and and some of the, the big ones where you actually have a dinner break in the middle and then continue on and the good thing about that is that the orchestra works so well as a team we're all in it together so we we sort of we egg each other on but certainly the stamina for, for the big big Wagner operas is that's that's a real a real challenge. There, we've, we've occasionally had conductors that are very unpleasant and sometimes you look at that and you think, oh, do I really want to have to deal with that? But these days, even that is changing and we've even had conductors where we've had a member of our staff attend all the rehearsals just to keep an eye on them. And, uh, yeah, the things, political correctness is, is a big deal these days. So... Yeah, a lot of conductors can't get away with being horrible. So some of them still try, but um, it, luckily that is dying out. Mm. 
Thank you for answering that. Did anyone else have any questions? No. Oh, Sarah. I've, I'm acting like I've never used Zoom before, but I've used it a lot, so it's very strange. Hello. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask if you had any favourite uh, recordings like other opera houses um, that you like to listen to, like, for instance, in, from Italy or or you just sort of, like, yeah. No. Uh, w when we're doing any anything that we're doing, I, I'm probably like everybody else and I just go to YouTube and I, I check out what comes up first. Uh, I like I like to listen to the New York Philharmonic, which I know is is not opera or ballet, but I'm particularly interested to hear Judith Leclerc because she's been a bit of a role model for me. She has been in her job for a very long time and played the same bassoon for all her career. So I do like to listen to her, and I like to see what she's doing. And the rest of the time. I do, while I do love music, don't get me wrong, I love music, but if I'm winding down, I love musical theatre. And this morning I heard the very sad news that Stephen Sondheim has just died at 91. I've, in our orchestra, we've actually done some Sondheim, quite a few Sondheim productions over the years, which I have absolutely adored. So in my spare time, I'm probably not going to listen to big operas, I'm going to listen to something else, and piano music. I still love to listen to piano music, and I love to listen to Marta Argerich, so it's, there's, a, oh, there's a feast of brilliant pianists out there. But as far as opera and ballet, I will, uh, I will go, with opera, I will go to YouTube, or whatever comes up. We're very lucky with ballet that through our attachment to the to the ballet we have um intranet which is within the company and they put ballet productions up on screen for us to watch there and it's often not the australian ballet but it'll be an overseas company doing a production that is then coming to australia so i will watch that yeah. on, on my laptop that way the ballet and listen yeah. to what's coming with the orchestra part yeah cool thank you Uh, Lucinda, we just had a few thanks in the chat um, from, oh, I'm scrolling too fast. Um, Kayla and I think Penny just said thank you. Oh, and Ben. And um, ben. So, much. so, yeah, I, well, thank you. So, is there anyone else got any more questions for Lucinda? No, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. And I, I want um, your insight into the audition process was was amazing even for someone who's done a lot of auditions to still to hear that again it just spot on oh good and um i heard judith leclerc live quite a lot and, and i love i love her playing too so. oh yes Thank i you. i'd love the opportunity to meet her i would love i would love to ask her one of the things i would really love to know is how she's had such longevity in her career as everything changes around her and young players come in, I, I would really love the opportunity to pick her brains on that. But that's a different topic for another day. Go to New York. <laughs> yes. Well, yes. Once we can all leave the country and, and fly again. Yes. That would be great. Okay. Well, thank you to everybody for attending and listening and... Yeah, thank you, Lucinda. That was really, really insightful. And um, I personally enjoyed that greatly. And I'm, everyone else has echoed that sentiment. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. You're very welcome. And I hope to see you all in the future. If you come to an opera or ballet and I'm there, give me a wave. We will. <laughs> <laughs> and stay safe, everybody. Thanks, Lucinda. <laughs> okay.